How is it going, everybody? This is Sean Barnes. I want to welcome you to episode 64 of The Way of the Wolf. Our guest on the show today is a gentleman named Dustin Sanchez. He actually was on the show about a year ago before we had video or anything like that. We were recording in my formal dining room just in, in the other room. The audio quality was not quite where we're at today in terms of production quality, But what was interesting about that episode, which I'm going to link it in the show notes below, it was episode 17, was Dustin and I had trained together a few different times, and I knew a little bit about him. But one of the things that I learned on that show, which was quite interesting, is his background in the Navy as an engineering tech, as a lawyer, as a marketing expert for lawyers. He had a dating blog, was doing real estate, flipping houses and things like that. All sorts of crazy stuff. Well, Dustin has kind of gone through a little bit of a transformation of his own in recent months, and I wanted to get him back on the show to talk through that transformation and then also talk about business and becoming the best version of ourselves. So, Dustin, welcome back. Thanks, Sean. Glad to be here. All right. Now, the first thing I want to touch on is becoming the best version of ourselves. We recorded a video together recently, which for those of you watching this on the channel, you'll be able to see a clip of that video here uh, at the end of the episode. But talk to me about what's driving you to kind of go down this new path that you're on. Okay. You know, by most people's standards i'm actually a pretty successful guy that's not bragging it's just the truth is what it is and last year was sort of a typical year for me you know i bought four houses i i you can see my abs when i'm out of shape you can only see three sets when i'm in shape you can see four sets with veins it's been like that for the last 30 years uh, monetarily, I'm good. Physically, I'm good. I have no depression, no anxiety, no mental issues. And my circle of friends and my family all live hand to mouth. They, you know, I, I woke up one morning and I realized my family is all overweight. Some of them obese. Like you wouldn't call them overweight. You'd say you're obese. My family, for the most part, if they lost one paycheck, it's bankruptcy. Uh, my family's on psychotropic or psychedelic. I don't know what you call it, but they're on medication to help their mental state. And I have a rather large family. And I woke up one day and I said, uh, uh, said Dustin, you, you have all this stuff. You're healthy as can be mentally on point. Uh, Some people would call you rich, you know, and you did not bring anybody with you. And that hurts. That hurts to admit right now. You are now. And if you think about that, it's very selfish. It's a selfish way to live. Now, to my credit, it's not because I haven't tried. Uh, Man, I talked to my family until I'm blue in the face. But what I realize is nobody is listening to you. They are watching you. And uh, so I knew I had to make a change. Right. And I needed to short track this. I couldn't take another decade to try to bring my level up the people that I love. I couldn't take another 10 years. So I short tracked it by hiring a mentor, a coach. I don't know if you've ever heard of Wes Watson. He has a YouTube channel called GP, uh, GP Penitentiary. Just Google Wes Watson. Uh, I had been listening to Wes Watson for about a year, opted into his email sequence, never really got down to it until right about February 1st, I overcame my third bout of the disease we're not supposed to mention in a year. And I said, man, I missed New Year's, so February 1st is my new year. What am I going to do? 
I got on the computer. I hired Wes Watson as a coach, and I told him what I just told you. And he said, we're going to make you undeniable to where somebody like your family can look at you, and it's a no-brainer. Just do what Dustin's doing, and my life will get better. The problem is that I've been doing all this rather secretive. You would Last year, you could look on my Instagram. You wouldn't know I was a successful person. You wouldn't know I had abs during COVID when I was supposed to be sick. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do now is represent outwardly the inward change that I've made over the years. Uh, and one of the one of my core beliefs that I learned from my mentor, Wes Watson, is that external changes reflect internal changes okay when when i show a topless shirt in the mirror and you see abs and striations i want you to know that there was an internal change that took place and that's reflected externally and the same thing when you see someone out of shape overweight uh depressed downtrodden eyes down not able to look someone in the eye that's an external reflection of what's going on internally and if we have the power to inspire someone, motivate someone, it is incumbent upon us to do that. Otherwise, you're just being selfish. And so that is the change now. That's what I'm making. Also, last time I was here, my main business was a lawyer marketing agency. And I would work with these lawyers. And after a couple months, they call me and they say, Dustin, we had our first six-figure month. You know, we made $100,000 in a month for the first time ever because of what I did for their business. And they're sitting on a plane on the way to Cancun to go drink their problems away, 40 pounds overweight, sitting on a plane not able to be present because they're ashamed of their presence, right? And what I realized was all this time for the last decade, I was making better law firms. I should have been making better lawyers. That's the root of the problem. You know, discipline is what's going to solve everyone's problem. And what I'm hoping to do now through my own Instagram, through my TikTok, my YouTube, is to display physically what discipline looks like. Visually display what a life of discipline looks like and what it can do for you. Does that answer your question? Very much so. <laughs> okay. I appreciate Sorry to get that. emotional for you there. No, no, that's that's completely okay. And and I understand. And I think that whenever some of the other guests that I've had on this show have achieved comparable levels of success. And one of the things that I've realized is it's not usually until we get into our probably mid to late 30s, sometimes early 40s, when we realize, hey, I've done all of these things. I've achieved the success for myself. And then we start looking around and you always hear the phrase, well, it's lonely at the top. OK, well, it's incumbent upon us, like you just said, to bring those along with us. Many of us are so driven to just scrap and claw and, and get to the top of whatever that means, get to the top, that we forget to bring those people along with us until we get to that that age. Maybe we have this epiphany of, what? Jesus, I don't want to be here alone. I want to bring these other people. And once you've achieved that level of success, you know how to do it. The trick then becomes, okay, how do I help others replicate that and doing is different from coaching which it sounds like you've just kind of experienced as well you you hired a mentor and now you're trying to figure out okay how do i get how do i bring these people along with me i've been trying not so successfully how do i bring them along with me now and i love that you're on this journey it's a similar journey that i'm on and others that have come on the show they're they're in a similar headspace and that's part of the whole purpose of this show is to to spread the message and to help others figure out their path because Dustin can't come in and tell Sean what his path is. Dustin can't come in and tell person A in the gym what their path is, but you can help them find their path by soliciting feedback from them, hearing their story, and shining a light down the hallway and say, hey, that might be a good path for you to go down. Check it out. 
And you can nudge them and encourage them, but they have to walk their path. Yeah, so true. Um, so many, you know, when I worked with Wes Watson, our first call, after he told me what he, after I told him, this is the problem I'm having in life, he told me, we're going to make you undeniable. And so now I'm standing by, ears open. What's the man going to tell me? This is a multimillionaire. This guy's ripped. This guy did 10 years in prison, got out of prison, became a millionaire in under three years. I'm all ears. What is he going to tell me to do? And you may be thinking like, he's got this 10 step program and he's going to describe each little thing to you in minute detail. And his basic advice was, I want you to wake up at four in the morning, do burpees and put that on Instagram. Now, a freaking loser, because there's so many losers would have questioned that, okay? Because uh, they would have said, but, but Wes, uh, that doesn't make any sense, okay? And this is the main problem you have in coaching is convincing people who know nothing about how to get where they're going to do the exact thing you're telling them to do because you're already where they're going and you know exactly how to get there. So I started doing that. I didn't question it. I started waking up at four in the morning, doing burpees, putting it on Instagram. My brother-in-law quit drinking. (laughs) Uh, My sisters wake up early to read their Bible and pray every morning. My nephew is now, who I've been trying to get through forever, has now joined my coaching program. My Instagram DMs are full of people. You're inspiring me. What can I do to lose weight? Lawyers I went to law school with who I haven't talked to in 10 years, messaging me on Instagram, help me drop these pounds, help me in my mindset. What if I had said, Wes doesn't know what he's talking about. This millionaire who's ripped, who spent 10 years in prison with zero advantages, got out in three years, became a millionaire. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to do my own program. Okay, when someone who's been where you're going, who's been where you want to be, tells you how to get there, just do what they say until they prove them, prove them a liar or that they don't know what they're talking about. Do what they say and you'll get, they have the blueprint, follow their blueprint and you'll get there. Man, I'm so grateful that I had the forethought to just do what the man said because... (laughs) Those 4 a.m. burpees are changing lives. (laughs) I grew up in an alcoholic house. And I know the damage that alcohol can do. And when a man puts that bottle down, he just changed destiny for his whole family. And that happened because I got up and started doing burpees. (laughs) Freaking burpees, you know. I got up and started doing burpees at 4 a.m. And I just changed destiny for an entire family. What if I had said no, you know? (laughs) Darn it, I got to quit crying, man. (laughs) I'm so happy right now because I can just, things are happening so fast. Uh, It's a blessing to have my 10,000 hours in now to where I can elicit change with just a thought because I've, I've got decades of work behind me to get to this point. And it's such a blessing that I met this man at this time in my life when, you can, when I have the ability to actualize things faster than ever before because I have the work in already. And I just needed a tiny little tweak. Hey, Dustin, don't be so dang selfish. 
Think about others. Wake up every morning and ask yourself, how can I best serve the world today? And that was the shift, man. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I don't even remember. Very much what. so. <laughs> What's really sticking out is freaking burpees because I have that feeling every day. Though it, it seems to have elicited a different response for you because of the impact that it's had on your life and your family and your friends and your followers and your colleagues and lawyers. And you're, you're impacting the lives of so many people around you. And that's phenomenal. Yeah. Very powerful. And I'll even... I want to put myself in check and say, I'm not impacting the lives of thousands. I've changed five lives. The people closest to me, who I love the most, my family. Start there. Start with yourself. Change your own life. Okay, and that's what I did. I started just changing, working on myself. And that circle grew to about five core members of my family. And now it's growing to about 20 people who are in my Instagram stories every day. And then it's going to grow and grow and grow. A lot of times people say they scare themselves. I can never help a thousand people. I can never help millions of people like, like Tony Robbins are my mentor. You don't start with yourself. Help yourself first. It's the best thing you can do for the world. And then the people closest to you are going to see that. And what if you work your whole life and you only change three lives? It's worth it, you know? <laughs> 100%. Do you ever come across people that you try to work with, you try to help, and they don't heed your advice? They don't listen. You want to help them because you care about them. They just won't listen. There's always an excuse. How do you overcome that? Yeah, there's a, I'll tell you the story. You know, I wanted to become a lawyer. A lot of times I work with lawyers and I tell them, Here's how you can transform your entire business. Go from not being able to pay your rent to become a multimillionaire. And I give them the exact blueprint and they, they start, but what will I have to do? But how much will that cost? Oh, but I don't like making videos. Okay, and let's shift from the marketing space, which is where I formerly was, to the life transformation space. Someone comes to me, they're embarrassed to wear a swimsuit at the beach they feel that tension, their children feels that tension, they're training their children to take on this anxiety, and they're asking me, I wanna join your program, but I can only work out four days a week. I wanna join your program, but I can't monitor my diet. I have a special diet, I can't monitor. <laughs> and I always think to myself, man, I wanted to become a lawyer, and I was sitting in my bed at 17 years old, uh, my father, his whole life, maybe made 25,000 a year. He's got to put five children through college. And in the end, it was only two. And so I'm sitting in bed. How am I going to go to law school? How am I going to go to undergrad? I said, well, I'm going to go to the Navy for six years. And that'll get me to undergrad. That's the price I'm willing to pay. I get to the Navy and they say, Dustin, if you can learn to be a nuclear engineer in 18 months, we'll let you stay here. We'll pay for your college after. So I said, okay, that's the price I have to pay. That's what I have to do. I'm going to learn to be a nuclear engineer in 18 months. I graduate. Uh, I finish the Navy. I start working. Now I got to pay for law school. Uh, college. I go to college while working. That was the price I had to pay. Work through undergrad to become an engineer. I'm an engineer now. Dustin, you can work at NASA during the day, and we'll let you go to law school at night. While everyone else is sleeping, you'll be working and studying. You'll be competing with nighttime students who they're full-time part-timers. That's what we call them. They had no job. Mom and daddy sent them there. They've got to pay for it. That's who you get to compete against. But if you finish, you can be a lawyer. Okay, and this was all the price I paid. I never asked, how much is it going to cost? What am I going to have to do? Because I was willing to pay any price. The freaking price did not matter. Champions don't care how much it costs because they're going to pay any price right and so you're asking me when you work with people they don't do what you say because they're not committed right they, they were never committed in the first place they they might want to lose weight there's no commitment there how do i know because you want to know how much it costs you want to know how much you're gonna have to do 
What if I tell you, if you read 100 books a year, you can make 50 grand a month. You can make 100,000 a month. Would you say, uh, that price is too high. I, I don't love my children enough to fulfill their dreams, to fulfill my dreams, so I can't read 100 books a year. What if I say, you can have the exact body you want if you just eat the exact macros I tell you to and you do the exact workout I tell you to. It's going to be more than four days a week. And you respond, well, I want my children to experience the anxiety of being overweight in the eighth grade. And so I'm going to model fatness. I'm going to model overweight for them so that they can learn this anxiety inducing pain from me. I could stop it, but I'm not going to, I don't love my children enough to wake up and work out five days a week. I only love them enough for four days a week. That's what I hear. And the question you ask is like, Dustin, how do you get people to follow the advice you give them? You have to break it down like that in these, you have to make, go to the pain points and, and say, what are we really doing here? How much do you love your kids? Oh, I love, everyone says that. My kids are my everything. I love my kids. My kids are my everything. Where are you on Friday night at, at 9.30? Out drinking beer at a club? You love your kids that much? You could change your kid's whole life if you woke up at 3.30 a.m. and read a book for an hour every day. You love your kids enough to do that? Oh, no, I, I just, I make an Instagram post and that means I love my kids. When I point these pain points out to people, break it down for them, what's really going on here? You begin to inspire just a little bit of change. It, it chips away. As they start to maybe wake up earlier. We'll just use that as, a, as an example. They actually start to feel good. It, it feels good and it's a reward system. And now that feedback loop makes them wake up earlier the next day because that's how we're supposed to live life. Nobody goes through a workout and they're like, ah, oh, I'm so depressed. You go through a workout and you're like, man, I'm glad I overcame that. It feels good to you. Well, do it again. If, it, if something makes you feel good, keep doing that thing. So long as it doesn't also make your life worse, like drugs or alcohol or overeating. That is the easiest. It's not easy. That's the wrong way to put it. But that's the best way I've found to inspire people to actually do the things. You have to move from logic to emotion. This is what champions do. People who are not good coaches, they try to motivate through logic. Hey, if you do six reps, you'll get bigger biceps. Champions move to emotion. What are the emotional triggers I can use to coach this person? Most, most people really do love their kids if they have them. Uh, most men feel a sense of duty to provide for their family. And a lot of them aren't uh, because they lack discipline. And when you point that out, hey, uh, your wife is working. She'd rather be at home with the kids why aren't you the man who can make that happen? You say that to some men and it inspires them. It inspires them to change because of that emotional trigger. Move In all that you do, try to move from logic to emotion when you're motivating people. It's a long right. answer. <laughs> no, it's very helpful. And, and whenever I think through a lot of the coaching that I do, I have a, a tendency to lean into logic because that's just how my mind operates. However, I like every other human, can get emotional. If I'm tired, stressed, hungry, all of those things, I, I can get emotional as well. I don't like it. Logically, I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Why am I? But at the same time, being able to tap into that emotion and, and use it sounds like that's key. Right. And we need to talk about what you just said, tap in. One of the major problems in our society today is that nobody's willing to get uncomfortable. And it is very hard for me as a coach to get into my 358 pound client's feelings. I know he's going to not like me if I tell him your life would just get better if you did the one thing I say. You want to do your own workout problem. I'm over here 161 pounds ripped to shreds. Who's better at making a workout program? Your 345 pound mind or my 165 year round ripped mind? You have to be willing to endure the pain 
and the karmic debt it takes to tell someone that. Most people aren't. They're not willing to get uncomfortable even if it's going to change someone's life. When I said that to him, he instantly started following my program. He's lost five pounds in the five days he's been following my program versus the 30 days we did it his way. What if I didn't want to endure the pain of getting into that uncomfortable conversation, switching from logic to emotion, making him feel embarrassed about, okay, you're right. You're Every day you're on Instagram with your shirt off and people love it. I'm over here sad with a 358 pound body and I hate my life. That's a hard truth to confront for yourself and as a coach to make someone go through that experience. But it was the thing that inspired him to change. So you're right. When you say tap into, you have to tap into your inner strength to be able to offend somebody because that's how people learn. You have to, to teach someone, you have to first tell them, you don't know something. I do know something and I'm going to teach it to you. Most people aren't willing to do that. <laughs> that, that candor is something that some coaches struggle with. You see, I mean, online coaching has become this whole phenomenon in recent years. You see hundreds and thousands of, of Instagram and Facebook and websites and, and people that are focused on life coaching and, and things like that. And now I haven't worked with all of them, but I, I feel like there's this perception of, hey, if I can be somebody's friend, then I can coach them. But a coach is more than a friend. A coach is somebody that can have that brutal, raw, honest conversation with somebody and say, hey, to your point, you're here. You need to get here. You don't know how to get here, but I do. You've got to listen to me. You're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You could do this better. You're doing that really good. You have to be able to have that brutally honest conversation with your clients. And I, I don't know if all coaches are, are comfortable doing that because having crucial conversations is not something that people are comfortable doing. It's not something that we're taught growing up. It's a skill that has to be built and developed over time. And you have to have a concerted effort in learning how to read people, how to understand people's emotions and how to convey messaging in a right way. Because I've also found in coaching, some people, you can hit them over the, over the head with a sledgehammer and say, hey, this is what you got to do. And that works beautifully. Other people, you hit them over the head with a sledgehammer, they're going to fall down and start crying and never come talk to you again. So you have to be able to read your clients and, and know what amount of pressure can I apply at what point in time. And then also... One thing that I have noticed is when you start applying that pressure, you can you can see when people start reaching their breaking point whenever they're about to crack, if you know the signs to look out for, if you know how to read people. I like to push people just past that breaking point, and then whenever they're about to snap, hold and wait and wait till they get comfortable there. Okay. All right. We good? Cool. Let's keep pushing and keep pushing. And once they reach that breaking point, people will react in different ways. Some people break down and start crying. Some people get pissed off and yell. Some people shut down and don't say a word. You learn more about that person. And then you can also coach them on, hey, this is what happens when you get to your breaking point. Let's try to adjust that behavior a little bit. Let's figure out, hey, how do we keep moving forward? But the key I've found is to push right to that breaking point and then hold and then wait till they get comfortable again, and then keep pushing. Wait till they're about to break, hold. It's just a gradual progression that has to just keep coming, and that's how you apply that consistent pressure over time, and that's how you make lasting change and really change people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. You hit on a, a lot of good points there, and you notice I don't have my cell phone on the table just because I don't want it to be a distraction out of respect for your podcast, but I'm going to grab it real quick to make a a point so just excuse me for a sec but <clears throat> this thing here you know this internet cell phone you talked about how online coaching has become such a thing recently and the reality is a lot of the world uses this for evil purposes uh your 
the corporations that run online and social media, their main point is to get you addicted so that you can't, so they can sell advertisement to you. I know that because that's what I did for a living was I ran social media ads. I knew how to interrupt someone in their day. Uh, the problem is if you're doing this all day, you're, you're gaining anxiety. You're gaining, uh, you're losing skills like how to communicate with people. Your whole validation comes from, did somebody like my post? And some dude, Johnny boy, little Asian chica 77 makes a comment on your post and ruins your whole day, you know, and, and now you got to keep scrolling so you can get another hit of dopamine. And then some people use this thing for even more destructive purposes, purposes like pornography, you know, and, and they're selling out their daughters and their wives and their mothers uh, through their addiction to pornography. Uh, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is this thing, this cell phone, the internet, social media is used for evil purposes. What I decided was I'm going to use this thing to make the world better and make my, <laughs> ah, I'm going to use this thing to make my whole family better. And I'm going to use this thing to hold me accountable. Okay. I can't, now I cannot miss a wake up time because I got a hundred people in my Instagram stories every morning. Look, did Dustin get up at three 30? If Dustin quits, I can quit. I'm not going to quit. Okay. I'm not going to back down. So yes, online coaching has become a thing because a large segment of the population has decided to fight back and say, we're going to take this thing back and use it for good, okay? I used to be someone who made fun of these online coaches, these life coaches, and now that's what I aspire to be, okay? Uh, let's talk about the difference between therapy versus coaching because one thing you st started talking about was being a friend. People think if they're your friend, they can coach you, okay? And I'm going to talk about therapy versus coaching. In my mind, therapy is let's get together and talk about our problems with our friends. Let's talk about our problems with our friends, and there's a need for that. Coaching, on the other hand, is about solutions. Let's get together, and I'm going to tell you the solution to your problem. And so I feel like Coaching, online coaching, is the next evolution of therapy, okay? What about Bob? Great movie. That was about therapy. Someday they're going to make, what about Dustin? And it's going to be how he coached people into solutions, okay? So therapy, you, get, you talk about your problems. Coaching, you talk about your solutions. And I cannot take credit for that. I learned that from Wes Watson. Uh, I can't take credit for any of this stuff. You hear me? You stay around me long enough, you're going to hear Tim Ferriss. You're going to hear David Goggins. You're going to hear Joe Rogan. You're going to hear Wes Watson. You take things from your mentors. You credit where you can. Because I'm an attorney, I have this need to credit people, and sometimes it interrupts my train of thought. So let's get back on it. You talked about applying pressure, okay? I want to talk about compassion, compression, okay? You can't be all one thing. This, I hate being a mean guy. It reminds me of boot camp. When I was in boot camp, our division commander, Petty Officer Payne and Petty Officer Caesar, you just knew they weren't, they were putting on a show being mean to you. Having grown up in a hard childhood, in, in a hard home, I know what real anger looks like. And that wasn't it. So their anger never bothered me, whereas it scared the heck out of other people who led more sheltered lives. But you have to com apply compassion, compression, and you always are trying to find the mix, just like you said. And what I tell people is, um, my niece actually called me because I offended her. And she wanted to have a talk about it. And I was happy to have that talk. And I told her, let me tell you how I live my life. I'm always trying to find the line and I cross it all the time and I just calibrate. It's never the end of the world. That's what people think. If I offend someone, my life is over. I'm canceled, it's over. You just back off and calibrate, calibrate. You, you cross the line, now you know, now you've learned, calibrate. Just like you said, you take them to the line, you step back over. 
And in doing that, you get stronger. I always liken it to the squat. My lower back can only deal with so much squat weight. But I never know what that is until I'm in the chiropractor. And it's like, I found the limit. Now I need to calibrate. Now I need to go build stronger. Uh, the only way you're going to find your limits is you got to be trying to step over the limits. You have to be trying to step over your limits. Sometimes that'll end you up in the hospital. You know, none of us are getting out of here alive. Okay, long ago, I burnt the ships. And I decided, I got a life sentence on this planet. I'm not getting out of here alive. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Um, I just wanted to touch on that. I wanted to touch on the difference between therapy versus coaching, trying to be someone's friend versus trying to give someone the hard truth that they need to hear. Knowing that, you're going to overstep that line. You just calibrate, okay? Uh, man, I shouldn't even bring this up. Maybe you edit this out. But because you mentioned I had a dating blog way back in the beginning when anyone starts online marketing, that's almost always how you start because there's just such a hungry market. You start trying to sell someone else's dating product. There are men who teach other men how to go up and talk to women in a bar. And sometimes it's awkward. You go talk to them and it's weird. You're like, hey, my name's Dustin. And they're like, who is this stranger trying to talk to six women? And you just like, okay, that didn't go over. Let me recalibrate. Hey girls, sorry. I know sometimes that's awkward. What's your name? You recalibrate. <laughs> uh, I take the good out of everything I learned. Largely, that whole dating space was not something I could agree with and I got out of it. But... I did learn, hey, recalibrate when you mess up and just try again. It's not the end of the world. I want to dig into that a little bit deeper. And we touched on your dating blog on the, on the last episode. And, you know, one of the things that I, I, I share with people is the importance of continuing to move forward, always moving forward. You may not be moving in the right direction, but even if you're going in the wrong direction, you learn what not to do. And it sounds like for you, that was, hey, I'm going to explore this, this dating blog, getting into online marketing and, and all of this stuff. And you get into it and maybe a year down the road, yeah, this isn't really for me, but you learned. You learned something from it. You probably learned some marketing stuff, how to generate revenue in, in online platforms and things like that. And you had to pivot and adjust. And that's so important to just keep moving forward. I see people that just stand still and they're in their their own thoughts and feelings. And why can't I progress? Why can't I why can't I move forward? Why can't I get this promotion? Why can't I get this raise? But they're not doing anything about it. And that's that's the problem. Keep moving forward, even if you're going the wrong direction. You're still learning. And then you can always six months, a year, two years down the road say, you know what? This isn't for me. I mean, hell, you're engineering tech, NASA, lawyer, lawyer marketing, dating blog, life transformation, real estate. Like you've gone down all these paths. You are now a wealth of knowledge, which has positioned you very uniquely into what you're doing now as a life transformation coach because you have experience in all these different domains and you know how to tie it all together and you're using fitness as a tool to kind of help inspire and motivate and tie this stuff together which i think is is very important i want to kind of dig into the fitness side of things but what are your initial thoughts whenever i share hey it's always about moving forward even if you're going in the wrong direction yeah uh the question really i have for that a lot of people are stagnant like they they the inertia of sitting still they can't get over the inertia of zero movement if you just start rolling, things would start happening. But here's the problem. What is my life purpose? Nobody wants to do anything until they figure their life purpose out. Okay? Everyone who's listening to this should go to Google and Google search Tim Ferriss 17 questions. Okay? 17 questions you should ask uh, yourself. And a lot of them help you overcome this inertia of zero movement. And one of the things he says is, don't think that you have to find your thing on the first hit. Do something where you're building systems 
that you're going to acquire to take to the next thing. So I wasn't trying to learn dating. I was trying to learn how to design a website. And that helped me design websites for attorneys. I wasn't trying to learn dating. I was trying to learn copywriting, how to write something on the internet that someone scrolling will stop and pay attention to and grab their heart in 140 characters. It had nothing to do with dating. Everything has a deeper purpose, okay? You got people out here who won't do anything because they can't figure out their life purpose, right? And so when you tell me uh, I, I did so many things, keep moving forward, that's exactly what I was doing. I was acquiring skills and all of those skills needed a different vehicle. I needed to learn how to deploy capital, how to, how to deploy massive amounts of capital. When you start making money, you have to figure out what do I do with this money? How do I? So I started buying real estate and that taught me how to deploy massive amounts of capital for higher return on investment. Now I got that skill now, I'm done. I haven't bought any houses this year because I just needed to learn that one skill. Uh, I needed to learn how to grow businesses. So I started growing law, law firms. I needed to net, learn how to use Facebook ads and social media to get attention and turn that attention into dollars. And I, what did I do? I hired 20 lawyers to pay me $3,000 a month to acquire that skill. That It had nothing to do with lawyer marketing. <laughs> okay, people paid me to learn this. Now, I need to learn how to inspire change in the people I love. And that's why I'm working with Wes Watson. It's got nothing to do with getting abs. Uh, he recognized that from our first conversation. He was like, okay, so you're not a typical student of mine. And he, he had a different path. Let me, for anyone that's got that, they don't want to move on. I'm trying to answer your questions as best as possible. Let me give you your life's purpose, okay? Here's your life purpose. I want you to assume a posture where you can cop, write this down, assume a, a state where you're in an elevated state because you really have to take this on board. Your life purpose is create the person you respect and admire in every way so that you can give that person away to the world. Pursue that purpose. You're going to go down many paths as you're doing that. You're going to go down the fitness path, the business path, the spiritual path. Always moving forward, like you said, to create the man or woman you respect and admire in every way. And now we're going to deal with the selfish element so that we can give that person away to the world. That's how you get what you want out of life. Whatever you want, you give that thing away. You want more energy? help someone get energy. You want fitness, find someone and help them get in shape. You want money to come to your life, help some business make more money. Okay, create the man or woman you respect and admire in every way. What time does Dwayne The Rock Johnson wake up in the morning? Because I sure do admire him. I'm going to go wake up at that same time. What does Dwayne The Rock Johnson self-talk sound like? Probably doesn't sit around like a little punk and complain about how he has nothing all day. I'm going to assume Dwayne The Rock Johnson's self-talk. Now, it's got nothing to do with The Rock, okay? What I'm telling you is, in your mind, you respect and admire someone. Be that person in every way. What do they eat? Do they stay up all night eating little Debbie Zebra cakes? The answer to that question is your life purpose, Okay. And then when you create, as you're creating that person, give that person away. Help, man, I used to go to the gym and I'd have my earbuds in and I'd just be in my own dark little world, angry, lifting. And I realized this is selfish. I need to be in here helping everybody have a better day. I'm taking out my headphones. I'm going to go awkwardly say hello to people. Just get in conversations and see what happens. I'm going to be here for the next 30 years. So go ahead and come interrupt me at the gym. This podcast, I'm not here to grow my audience. I'm here to grow your audience. I'm here to make the Way of the Wolf podcast the best it can possibly be. Get you as much influence so that you can change the world as possible. 
Why am I trying to give that to you? Because that's what I want. I want to be able to change lives. And the only way for me to get it is to give that thing away. I'm going to say it one more time. For anyone out there who's trying to find their life purpose, they don't know what to do. Here's your life purpose. Create the person you respect and admire in every way so that you can give that person away to the world. It's about the journey. Whenever I, as you were sharing all of those thoughts, one of the things that came to mind for me was, was my own evolution over the past few decades and how in my younger years, in my 20s and, and early 30s, I was just so, I was selfish. I was just very selfish. And I was trying to scrap and claw and figure out how do I get to the top? How do I get that VP title? How do I get this salary? How do I do all of these things? And there was a lot of frustration and anger. Why can't I get there? What, why is he better than me? He's only working half the time that I am. What, like, what is going on here? And over the years, I've just I've gradually evolved, which speaks to this being an evolution. You, for me, I wasn't able to flip a switch and start doing burpees at 4 a.m. and it completely changed my life. For me, it was an evolution that occurred over time. And once I, I, I figured out, I learned new skills. I learned effective communication. I learned how to read people, how to interact with people. I've been such an introvert for the entirety of my life. I didn't want to talk to people. I wanted to sit in my office and bang away at a keyboard. And, and I thought if I work as if I work 80 hours a week, I, I should get that VP title. And that's not how it works. You have to develop new skills. And it wasn't until I was, <laughs> I say very fortunate to have the opportunity to lead human resources. At the time I was questioning my sanity whenever I stepped in because it was so far out of my comfort zone. But as I started to learn how to read people, how to understand people and build and develop those skills, I realized, hey, I can take all those skills that I've developed throughout the majority of my life and marry them with these skills that I now have to create something great. And once I started to learn how to achieve success, it then became, okay, how do I help others achieve success? How do I... How do I coach them? Which in itself was another skill that I had to learn. But it's really about that, that fulfillment that comes in life comes from helping other people. That is the purpose. It's the journey of getting there and then coming to this realization. We're here to help others. And if we can't help ourselves, there's no way in hell you can help others. So you've got to get your own mind right first. Once you do that, then develop those skills and learn how to help those others around you. And this can feel like a, a monumental task. Again, 15 years ago in my career, I was thinking, there is no way in hell I could accomplish that. There's no way in hell I'm doing all of this stuff and I'm not moving the needle at all. What the hell? And, and it just, it drove me mad. Thousands of hours of sleepless nights that just... It, it it drove me mad. And for me, it was an iterative approach. It just takes time. Now, as leaders and coaches in, in business and life and fitness, I think the onus on us is on us to figure out how do we get them there faster. And the purpose of the show, you, you mentioned this earlier, for me, the purpose of the show and the coaching that I do and all the people that I help out is – it's taken me 20 years to figure out the things that I've figured out. If this messaging that you and I are sharing today can help compress that time for someone to, to 10 years, to eight years, to three years, and they can achieve a comparable level of success in a shorter amount of time, I mean, that's that's what it's all about. You can help more and more people, and there's there's this... There's this ripple effect of, okay, I helped, I helped these five people in my immediate circle. Okay, once they get to where you're at, if they can help three people in each of their immediate circles, think about the impact. And, and that's how you have the, the ability to impact 
multiple generations in thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. It's not that Dustin Sanchez can sit down and directly influence or impact 100,000 lives, but you do it through that network that you build. You build leaders, they build more leaders, and you help them figure out how, how, do, you, how do they build all of those people around them. Yeah, so true. Uh, time is a funny thing. Um, what I'm discovering is that champions don't co- consider time. We're, have you ever been in flow state? Time just passes. You don't notice it. You're Maybe you were writing a paper and you just got into it or you were hitting a heavy deadlift or squat workout. Next thing you know, two hours had went by. When you're in flow state, there's no timeline. And you want to be in flow state as much as possible. Okay. Uh, a lot of times we say, I want to become successful by the time I'm age 35 or, or something like that. And you put this time burden on you and it's, it stifles your creativity. I, w- I like to tell people, you got a life sentence. My client was like, uh, I, I'm trying to get ripped in the next 30 days. And I'm like, brother, you're going to be ripped for the rest of your life. There's no hurry. Okay, there's no time. We got a life sentence. We're not getting out of here alive. But that being said, how can we compress the timeline? Um, long ago, I read that book. Uh, oh, boy. That's going to be embarrassing. Can't remember the name of it. Anyways, there's a book, and he talks about the mastermind group. <laughs> saying that, a lot of people are immediately saying, oh, I know which one he's talking about. Um, that was the one of the last things I implemented was – bringing on some kind of accountability partner, someone to hold you accountable, who if you did not do the work, you had to admit this to that person and lose respect. That's what motivates me is respect. Find what motivates you. One way to shorten the timeline of anything you're trying to do is get an accountability partner. You know, what if you're a salesperson, you know you got to make 10 cold calls a day or else it's not going to work. If you don't have someone that you respect, love, and admire holding you accountable, it's easy for you to slack off. So let's talk about accountability in one hand. Second, the way to shortcut the process is to just find someone who's already done it and do exactly what they do. Find a mentor. Tony Robbins calls it modeling. Okay, Uh, some people call it hiring a life coach who's already doing what you're doing and do what they say. Those were two things I resisted for so long because of my own mental weakness. I wasn't strong enough to admit to a man that I'm failing on a daily basis. When I did, I quit failing that day. You know, (laughs) that's the way to shortcut the process is a one. You need some accountability in your life. That's what these life coaches provide. Once a week, we meet in a group. Everyone tells how they did this week. You got to admit in public whether you failed or not. That motivates you like crazy to actually not fail, to do the work. To some people who are trying to get ripped, they hire someone who is already ripped. People who are trying to become a videographer, they hire a life coach that's already a videographer. So accountability and then model someone who's already doing it. But don't just model them. Get in their space, even if that means you have to buy their highest level program. Get in their orbit so that their things will rub off on you. If this were a tuning fork and I were to hit it, bing, it's vibrating at a frequency now. And if I grab this one and this is a tuning fork and I bring it over here, this one's gonna start vibrating at the same frequency. You need to get into successful people's space because they're vibrating at a very high frequency and it's going to rub off on you. It can't not do it. Everything is energy. We're just energy particles, you know, and Sean gets near me. We're hyped on a Saturday for leg day. Now we're both freaking jazzed up to do legs where I was only going to do a couple sets that day. But now you're hyped. I'm hyped. Get accountability. Get a mentor who's vibrating at a very high rate. And you're going to start doing that, too. That's how you shortcut the timeline. One of the things that I found interesting in, in recent years is, is sitting back and observing the 
substantial amount or the lack of accountability that exists in the world today. It seems like everyone has an excuse. Everyone has a reason. And I and I haven't been around long enough to know if, okay, is this just like a millennial thing? Is this just something over the past decade? I, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something, surely you've picked up on that. Is that fair? Yeah. It's what are your thoughts on that? Some of that is cancel culture. Like, it is rude to hold someone accountable now. Okay, you go to Whataburger. You order bacon cheeseburger, no onions. It comes with onions. If you're upset about that, now you're a jerk. Now, reality, that's not a big deal, you know, but the, the reality is that person that took your order was never listening in the first place. They're going to get paid either way. They know that. Uh, I think the last time we had a podcast, I told you the story about when I took my dad to the doctor for an earache and the doctor says, okay, go home and clean your ears out. When the reality is if that doctor's father had came in there with an earache, he would have left with clean ears. But that doctor knows he's going to get paid either way, whether my dad leaves with an earache or not. So it's easier for me to say, you go home and clean your own ears out. There is this uh, anger towards anyone who tries to hold anyone accountable. Okay, I think part of that is because they want us doing this all day. They don't want us making our lives better. They want us doing this, scrolling on your phone so they can sell advertisements. Because if you make your life better, you're not going to be on the phone looking at someone else's life. You're going to be living your own life. That's why there's no accountability. We've all bought into the bull jive that they're selling us. And their life that they have planned for us does not include accountability. Because if you have accountability in your life, you're going to make a life that you want to experience yourself versus experiencing this life where you're just scrolling. This is why I ask all of my clients, the moment your alarm clock goes off, get out of bed, don't scroll. Because what happens is someone's alarm clock goes off and it's their phone. They pick their phone up and they start looking at someone else's life scrolling because they hate their own life. Well, the only way to quit hating your own life and trading it to look at someone else's life is to get up and make your life better at that moment. Do you think The Rock scrolls? Do you think Dwayne The Rock Johnson wakes up and spends the first hour scrolling on its social media looking at someone else's life? Or Kevin Hart? Or Oprah? Do you think Oprah... People are scrolling Oprah's life. We're watching their lives. Build a life where you don't have to escape through scrolling in the morning. Well, what is that going to take? Accountability. You're going to have to have some accountability in your life if you want to make changes. They know that. The people who are running things, are controlling things. Now I'm a conspiracy theorist. They know accountability is the key to you making a life you don't want to escape. And that's why accountability is disappearing because they can't sell advertisements if, if you love your life. Because you're not going to be watching someone else's life. Okay. We have gone completely off script. I've got all these fantastic notes here. And while we've covered some of this stuff, I do want to touch on something else here. I want to talk about starting small businesses. Perfect. You've got some experience in this arena. I have no doubt that you have clients that are in this arena. I do as well. What do you think is the biggest challenge? Someone, okay, you've got someone who, who sees your content online and says, reaches out to you, hey, Dustin, I want to start a business. What is the biggest challenge that they're going to face from your experience? Burn rate, okay? This is why in, there's a way to start a small business, okay? What I advise everyone to do is start a service business first because businesses have burn rates. One of my friends started a mini blinds business and every day she had to wake up and find a bunch of people who wanted to burn, buy mini blinds. Well, that's a one and done. One hit, you've made that client, they might not buy mini blinds for another five years or ever in their life. A service business, there are all kinds of service businesses, but the one I did was online marketing for attorneys. I, I make a sale and an attorney pays me every month 
forever. They can't leave because if they leave, they're not going to get clients anymore. So now let's say I sell someone for $2,000 a month. I provide the service. That income stream is there every month. Then what do I do? I stack another 2000 on top of it. Go sign another client. Get them going. Now I'm making 4000 a month. Then what I do? I stack another monthly recurring income. So you're, people are starting a business, and what do they do? I want to sell T-shirts. Okay, you sell one $25 T-shirt. After all said and done, you made $5 profit. Your business is burning through more than $5 a day. How many people do you have to sell a T-shirt to every month just to make five grand a month, 10 grand a month. Okay, you're dealing with one and done clients. Okay, so if you're gonna start a business, first start a service business, build your capital. Then the problem with service businesses, they're hard to scale because you gotta do the work when you sign the client. So you gotta be building your capital, saving money. Then you can use that capital to deploy into some other scalable business like what I'm doing now. A lot of people aren't going to pay me four grand a month to be their life coach, but I could probably get a thousand people paying me $97 a month. And all I got to do is meet with them on Zoom once a week and make a program that everyone can use. It's scalable, but you can't start that way. Very few people can because burn rate, you run out of money. Your company burns through money. You got to pay rent. You got to pay Facebook ad fees. You got to pay hosting fees. You got to pay a salesperson. A service business, if you start, you'll learn everything you need to know to, to run a scalable business and you're going to be getting paid every month. So you can just stack income. You need stackable recurring income when you're starting a business. And the reality is it's too easy because nobody knows how to make a Facebook post. Nobody who owns a business knows how to make a Facebook post. Why? They're, they didn't grow up with it. You got all these 19 year olds who grew up on this thing this is their native language they can easily make six facebook posts a week for seven businesses at a thousand dollars a month now you're making seven grand a month most people are going to college so they can learn how to make seven grand a month they're sitting there in women's studies and the reality is when they get out of college now they're gonna have to learn how to make money <laughs> what did you just waste now you got four years of wasted time four years of less youth, four years of debt, and you still don't know how to do the thing you went to. But Dustin, I went to college to learn. Give me a break. You went you, your whole life. You wanted to be a sociology major. You didn't know what that was until you signed up for college. Uh, that's what I say when you're starting a business. You got to get the right vehicle. Your business needs to be recurring, stackable, recurring income base. Someone pays you every month to provide a service for them. A lot of those are other small business owners. One of the things that I think is also vitally important when you're starting a business is focusing on the exchange of value. What are you able to bring to the table? How are you able to help that client? And sometimes that means doing work for free. My, my, the stuff that I do coaching, I coach for an entire year. There's probably eight different people that I was coaching on a regular basis that I didn't charge anything for. It was about exchange of value. And then one day I got the phone call of, hey, how much is your program? And I started charging for it. For me, it was about one, building those skills, the exchange of value, the networking, the experience. What are you bringing to the table? How are you making their life easier? Instead of just saying, hey, I've got this product or I've got this service, here's here's the cost and it being purely transactional i don't think that's the best way to create stickiness with your potential clients to have that recurring revenue if you just want a one and done transaction okay fine great for me i would much rather have a long-standing relationship that grows into a partnership where both parties benefit from it and yes there is a financial component to it but I also think about, for me, how do I use the, the revenue that comes in as a vehicle to impact more lives? The, the coaching, the things that I, that I do, all that money, I haven't 
paid myself a dime. It goes right back in to my coaching business. It goes to buying this audio equipment, buying the cameras to try to get the message out there and help people. So for me, the exchange of value is, hey, I'm I'm helping impact these people's lives and the money I get is helping me purchase this equipment to then help more people's lives. So there's a mutual exchange of value that occurs. Now, I, I realize that a lot of times when people are starting their own business, they don't have any money. Money is a challenge, and I get that. I highly encourage people, start something on the side to start honing your craft, building that momentum. And at some point, it will build enough momentum and mass for you to jump off and, and do it full time. And I know other people that say you will never be successful unless you leave your full time job and go all in on it. Maybe that works for some individuals, and I'm sure it does, but for the majority of the world, we don't have that luxury of just saying, hey, I'm cool not getting paid for a few years and, and starting. So you have to go into it with a plan. You have to put some thought into it and figure out, hey, how can I do this? How can I have this exchange of value? How can I get my bills paid so that I can grow this and ultimately achieve what I'm hoping to achieve? Have you seen that? Yeah, that's a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up, exchange of value, because I kind of erred in going with the logic. Hey, you need to cover your burn rate. You need monthly stackable income. You went uh, with the primary purpose. The thing everybody needs to hear is this. Don't start a business to make money. Start a business to help people, all right? That's why I have more clients than I can service right now. More people waiting in line who have already paid for a $400 30-minute consult to get me on the phone than I can service because I'm known as the honest lawyer marketer and you won't find another one around. I'm here to make lawyers' lives better. I'm not here to run Facebook ads. I'm not here to make money. I'm trying to make your life better. Okay, that's why I got into the business of lawyer marketing because I had my own firm and the people I hired screwed me over. And I thought if it's me, I can help a lot of people by just actually providing the service that they're paying for. So you can't from a selfish standpoint because the universe knows if you're getting into business to start money, you're going to have a to make money, you're going to have a hard road to hoe. Okay, you're going to have a hard road. If you get in business to solve a real problem for people, to help people who are experiencing a real problem, and you have the answer to that, you're going to have more business than you can handle. And so you're very good about that value exchange. You're right. Well, one of the things that also comes to mind for me is <clears throat> I see some people that are, that are starting their business and they come right out of the gate with with the cost instead of focusing on on the value and i have for me if someone's able to to sit down have a conversation with me and and talk through okay how can we help each other out what is this what is this all about and i see the value i will throw money incessantly at that person if i perceive value however if they come to the conversation fire off an email to me hey it's going to be you know, a thousand bucks for this type of thing. Okay. Well, that feels very transactional. And for some people and some businesses, if that is something they need, okay, cool. For me, I would much rather have something that's mutually beneficial and I will just make it rain as long as it's adding value. And at that point, you build that lasting relationship. You build that partnership that is mutually beneficial. Yeah. What a lot of what you're getting into there is almost like the cold call or the cold email or the first email. If you have a LinkedIn account, you get these all day where they're like, Hey, Dustin, just want to mutually provide value for you. We have this thing for $9.99. I've never met this person, I know nothing about them. I tell my own business clients the purpose of the first message first of all, you want to. You're kind of right. You don't really want to talk about price. The person, the purpose of the first message is typically just to get into a conversation with someone. You don't want to give someone price if you're not even in a conversation yet. And a lot of times, 
there's two ways this can happen, outbound and inbound, right? So if you're an attorney or you're a business owner, a dentist or a plastic surgeon, someone calls your office and they're like, how much is it for a nose job? The answer to that is never a dollar amount. The answer is never, uh, typically our nose jobs are $4,997. They're not covered by insurance. The answer is, well, tell me why do you want a nose job? You need to get into a conversation. You need to, you, you need some buy-in from them first. You need a micro-commitment from them first. And just them admitting to you why they want a nose job is a micro-commitment. It's buy-in. And the next thing is, oh, well, actually, we've been rated as the best plastic surgeon for rhinoplasty in the greater Houston area. And here are a few of our case studies on this. And now you got a little more buy-in. And then you're like, if you could get a no nose job with us, when would you schedule it? Well, I guess my schedule is open for next week. Okay, great. We'll put you on the calendar for next. You haven't even talked about price yet. Okay, that's inbound. Now let's talk outbound, which is what you were talking about. Maybe someone, a stranger or an acquaintance, emails or text messages or talks to you. And they just come up and out of the gate with price. Imagine you're walking down the street and a stranger approaches you with their hand out. Can I have $5? You're a little bit, you're taken back. Like, hey, back off. You don't even know this person. That's what it feels like when someone right out of the gate is like giving you price, asking you to buy. A better way to do something like that, like for my business where I'm trying to, if I was doing cold outreach, trying to sell fitness coaching, first I would email someone who I kind of know, like someone from law school, and I might say, hey, I'm starting this new life transformation fitness coaching business. I'm hoping to work with attorneys. Do you know anybody who might be interested, another lawyer who might want to get in shape? Now, maybe they're going to say them. Maybe they're going to say no, but I know Matt's trying to get in shape. Would it be okay for me to reach out to Matt and just let him know that I'm starting this business and that you thought he might be interested? You know, that's a better way. Okay. Or maybe they're interested and they say, actually, I've seen what you're doing online. I'm kind of interested. How much does it cost? Like maybe they get into that. The answer to that email is not $9.97. The answer is, well, tell me your fitness goals. Let's get on the phone and just talk about your fitness goals and maybe we can work together. And now you're in a conversation where they're like, well, I've got rheumatoid arthritis and I've always tried to get in shape, but my joints just won't let me get in shape. Because, Well, hey, maybe I'm not even the person who can offer help for someone with RA. So why would I even give them a price before I've gotten to a conversation for them? Or maybe I've worked with 100 rheumatoid arthritis and they're going to pay any price I quote them because I can really help them. You want to start conversations. There's actually a conference in Austin run by Manny Chat every year. That's called conversations because the purpose of their chat bot is just to get into a conversation that can help any business. If you're a personal trainer, if you're an executive coach, just go get into conversations with people. I want to go ahead and touch on this a little bit more. I get instant messages or DMS or emails, people reaching out to me all the time saying, Hey, I can coach you to grow your business beyond your wildest dreams. It's like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Have you done any research on me at all? Whenever you're reaching out to people, do a, spend five minutes doing a little bit of research on who the person is, what they do for a living. If you're reaching out to a coach telling them you're going to coach them on how to build their business, that might not be the best fit. And it comes across as being very arrogant. And it just, it's a, it's very off putting from the start. So the only other thing in terms of if you're reaching out to people trying to get clients, do a little bit of research so that you can come to the conversation and know a little bit about what you're talking about. Have some sort of a sense of what the conversation is going to look like, who you're talking to. I've had people on Instagram reach out to me trying to become my fitness coach. It's like, okay, I'm not, this is going to egomaniac here, but I don't need a fitness coach. Like, have you looked at any of my stuff? Fitness has been my life. Like I, I okay. 
All right. Okay. Off my off my rant there. Well, no, you're right on target because doesn't that go with what you said? Lead with value. Mm-hmm. Okay. Being a marketing expert, I know that's just someone hooked into sales manager on LinkedIn and they got an automated bot to send that same message to everybody. When a higher return on their investment would be exactly what you said. Okay, I've been on Sean's LinkedIn for a good month. I see he works with executives. Here's a podcast he would like. Let me just send this to him. Hey, Sean, I see what you're doing with executives. This guy, Bob, the executive coach, has an excellent podcast. What are your thoughts on this episode or, or something like that? You know, lead with value. Exactly. And and one thing that I do have to say on LinkedIn when software companies reach out to me, I mean, I, my messages are, are blown up all the time. And most of the time people reach out to me, it's just very transactional. But when somebody emails me or sends me a message on LinkedIn, hey, I was listening to your last podcast with Dustin and this message really resonated with me. I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. Don't bring up their product. Don't bring up anything at all. But that first contact in my mind, I'm like, oh, you know what? This is a listener. I want to take some time and have a conversation with them. And this f- flows right back into adding value. And yes, we spend half a million dollar a year on software solutions. And if someone can open that doorway to a conversation and then come in and show value, hey, maybe we do go with a different vendor. And, and it all comes down to just Establishing that relationship and having a conversation instead of just a transaction. Yeah. And it needs to be genuine as well. Genuine. Like it can't just be, I'm going to send this message that I like this podcast just so I can get the sale. If you really like someone's podcast, maybe you want to do business with that person, mm-hmm. you know, and, and be genuine about it. Because those are, all, you can also tell those right off the bat as well. Like, ah, this person. They must have heard on a podcast to go like every one of my posts and then come ask me a question so they can sell me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you you can pick up on those people. It's very easy to spot those fakes that do it. But when people will send me a message and, and they cite certain topics that were discussed in an episode that I didn't post clips on, for me, that's an indication of, okay, they took the time, they listened to the podcast, one, I appreciate them listening, and two, okay, well, let's just have a conversation. Let's see what this is all about. And and sometimes it's not even about any sort of transaction. I had, I, I use this story quite a bit. There was a gentleman named Jared Richardson who worked for Dell. He was our Dell rep whenever I worked for another oil field services company probably 10 years ago. And we had had a few Dell reps come and go over a, a handful of years, and Jared came in and sat down and introduced himself. And this was in 2009, whenever oil fell off a cliff for a little, it bounced back much faster than it did in, you know, 15 to 16. But he came in and sat down and I was like, man, I just right off the bat, hey, look, we're not buying anything. We laid off 40% of the company. We've got all this extra equipment. He's like, hey, like, I'm not worried about that. I just want to have a conversation. I want to see what's going on, get to know you a little bit. He ended up taking me to the gun range a few times, took me to breakfast and had lunch. And we just, we just had conversations. And then that relationship grew Two and a half years later, we ended up spending $3.2 million with Dell in one year because of a massive project that we had. And I leaned on him and I leaned on him, Jared and Brent and and all the, the solutions architects at Dell that we had built relationships with that they came to the table year after year, month after month just adding value and like, hey, you can reuse that server if you do this. Let's add a little bit more RAM. Let's do this, saving us money on the front end. And then that turned into a massive multi-million dollar project, which was huge. Well, huge for us. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, $3 million at Dell is, you know, immaterial. But And that's what it's all about. It's about building those relationships. And, for, and, and again, I realize that there's businesses that are very transactional, but in my years of experience, when you build that relationship and trust, that's what generates that stickiness and, and the partnership. Yeah, for sure. What else do you want to talk about? Let's see what I have here, brother. Uh, we talked about 
did we talk about content creation, exchange of value, face to face? I think we covered everything. Uh, All right, let's talk it. about before we wrap this up. Then I know you like to read. You read a lot of books. I always see your posts in the morning, and and you take notes, and you're highlighting, and you're reading little excer- excerpts and things like that. What is the most powerful book that you've read in the past year? Man, I read so many books, but this year. And when I told Wes Watson, he's like, what do you read? And I just start naming off all these books. And he says, you read a hundred books. What you need to do is read the same page 100 times. And that's what I'm focusing on now. Uh, I don't know if it's the most powerful book I've ever read, but the book that I'm reading over and over right now is called 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class by Steve Siebold. And I am only at page at number one at number 14 because every one of them I'm just reading over and over. And it's like, ah, this is how champions think. This is what goes on in their mind. This is why their thoughts produce the physical results that they're getting because they think these things. I recommend that book to anybody if you don't mind a lot of swear words and cursing. Wes Watson actually just published a book called Non-Negotiables. And you talk about me reading every morning. That's part of a non-negotiable daily process that I don't deviate from. I call it running program because that's what Wes Watson called it in prison. They run program. You want to minimize the amount of decisions you have to make per day. I wear blue shirts, gray shirts, black shirts. I don't have to think about dumb little things like what kind of shirt am I going to wear. I don't have to think about am I going to sleep in in the morning because I'm not. I'm going to get up. I'm going to walk a mile. I'm going to read. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to write my goals down. Then I'm going to get to work. Non-negotiable daily process. Establish this in your life and when you fix the tiny little things, you'll be amazed at how much energy you have left for the big things that come up. Like, am I going to do cocaine when all of my friends come over with a kilo of it? You know, are you going to be able to make that right decision? Well, heck, I've got a whole day of tiny little wins stacked up. This is going to be like nothing. Of course, the answer is no. Uh, Or maybe something that more people struggle with. You know, you it's after work. Your wife isn't home yet. The kids aren't home. Am I going to turn on porn and freaking ruin my whole family's life? Well, not if you've been running your daily process. You hit your, you hit your macros on point at every meal. You got up and you walked a mile in the morning. You, hit, you didn't scroll in the morning. All these little things, all these tiny little wins that you stacked all day. Now, when the thing that stump, causes a lot of men to stumble, infidelity, porn, whatever, you've already won your whole day you've been winning and it's nothing to just win past that big test. Uh, but the books, two books I would recommend. Non-negotiables by Wes Watson if you don't mind a bunch of foul language and 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class which is, there's no foul language in there. <laughs> Dustin, always a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show, share the things that you've learned. It, it's just, I, I, I really can't thank you enough. It's, it's, I really enjoy these conversations with you. Yeah, feelings mutual. Very grateful to be here. Thanks a lot. Okay, how do people contact you? Best way to get in touch with me right now is on Instagram, at Undeniable Army. I'm not going to mention anything else, just Instagram, at Undeniable Army army all right perfect okay for all the listeners out there i can't thank you all enough for taking the time to watch the show on youtube again i've got a url youtube.thewaythewolf.com go check it out like and subscribe and share trying to get my followers up there would really appreciate it for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, I'm going to try and see if I can con Dustin out of a little bit of video footage from a workout that we did recently, see if I can tack it on to the, to the end of this video. And then 
Yeah, feel free to. Actually, you know what? I would really appreciate feedback. For all of you listeners that listened to Dustin and I's first episode, episode 17, a year ago, to and listen to this episode, share some feedback on what you noticed. See if you picked up any sort of differences within Dustin, within myself. Reach out to me, Sean, at The Way of the Wolf. I'm just really curious. I listened to that episode myself a few days ago and had a little bit of a realization event in terms of how far both of us have, have come in such a short period of time. Dustin, thank you. All right, man. All right, man. Have a good one. <laughs> you too. All right, Undeniable Army, my undeniable soldiers, Dustin Sanchez, your motivator, your inspirator. Look me up on IG, at Undeniable Army. I'm here with Sean Barnes. Give him your IG handle, Sean. The underscore Sean Barnes. All right, Sean Barnes runs The Way of the Wolf podcast. Check him out, download it. Great podcast. I've been a guest on there myself. Today, we're going to hit lower body, just general strength and conditioning. We're going to start off with some tire flips. And then Sean's going to take us through the rest of the workout. soldiers at undeniable army on instagram we're closing it out with sean barnes here the way of the wolf podcast saturdays with sean are always crazy it's always go 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 you know you just got to keep moving you know you run into these obstacles in life you got a choice to break or break through today we broke through we kept on moving let's hear from sean barnes at the way of the wolf podcast take us home brother how's it going check me out the underscore sean barnes on instagram got a youtube channel youtube dot the way of the wolf dot com check me out all right guys it was too easy today never stop moving never quit peace out <laughs>